And so going back to the night of the fire, so we're talking the afternoon, Sunday afternoon, the 8th, I believe, and uh, I'm here in Santa Rosa, and I didn't notice any change until about 10.30 at night. I mean, I wonder, you, you, you live nearby here, um, and, and until your daughter called, were you aware the weather my was sister, changing? It's my sister. Your sister, I'm sorry. Uh, were, you, were you aware anything was there going was on? There was nothing in going on in Lake Park. The, the winds were absolutely still, and uh, um, there was nothing going on. No, no evidence of any aberrant weather, any fronts coming in, anything like that. So when did you start to notice? What, what, when, when did you first occur something was going on? When I first found out about it was the following, the following morning. And phone call or? Um, I uh, connected with my sister. She told me what had happened. I became aware of the fires and, um, and uh, started uh, kind of doing reconnaissance on them. Because we had in Lakeport, if you look at a, a large map, we had basically fire on three sides of us. So um, kind of a you know, triangular shaped pattern. Uh, there was fire, a big fire all the way on the other end of the lake. Um, the one in Redwood Valley was going on, and then uh, the one near um, in Matt's, near Matt's house at times fire that burned into Santa Rosa. Did you call Matt in the morning and compare notes of what you guys were seeing? Not, not as of that point, no. So you were just trying to figure out what the heck's going I'm on? I was just trying to figure out what the, what the heck's going on. And when you talked to your sister down in Napa and got a heads up that there was some big winds and you weren't feeling it, and then all of a sudden three fires are going on all around you, you turn on the news that Napa and Santa Rosa are also ablaze. I mean, I think you're up in the pocket fire, they called it up there. Is that what they're calling it? The Let's see, which fire was it? It was, um, yeah. The Redwood Valley one, I think they're calling the pocket fire. That's the pocket fire. And then the, the one on the other side of the lake, I was watching really closely because it was burning into a cul-de-sac formed by the lake itself. That, that was the, the prevailing winds were pushing it in that direction. So it could only burn to the water. But what I was concerned about is if we got a wind shift and it hooked around and would have burned down Highway 20 uh, toward Lakeport. So, when, so I was watching that one really closely. When you started to see on, probably on TV the devastation when they started showing these homes and complete uh, dustification, evaporation of, of, of all the buildings, what, what were you thinking as a fireman? Well, I don't watch TV. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I haven't watched TV in 25 years. So I get my information from the internet and I have my sources that I go to. And um, the, the, the first thing um, that I noticed, I think, was the uh, rapidity of the fire movement, which seemed abnormally fast to me, considering that there was no weather fronts or winds or anything that, that I was aware of that would have driven the fires that quickly. And also the number of fires was extremely alarming. Where did all these fires come from? Mm -hmm. How did they all start at once? And so I, uh, I started digging. And um, uh, when I started digging, I started looking at the research that was available for uh, uh, directed energy weapons. And uh, what I started reading actual government documents that people had put up, various people had put up on the website, and uh, um, looking at the destruction, which I have never seen in my career, the totality of the destruction on the structures. There was absolutely nothing left of the structures except foundation. Now, I've seen that with other fires, but not where it moves like that, not where the fire is moving and one side of the street everything's fine, the other side of the street looks like a like a, a nuclear war zone never seen anything like that um, what, so, what other options could there be besides a, a, a high torch directed energy weapon that you could consider as a possibility in your experiences of all the fire fighting you've done there's none that I could think of there's none so this is the only plausible this explanation is, that's being the only presented possible explanation in my opinion that's the conclusion that I was brought to based on my almost 30 years of experience. And you know that steel melts in thousands of degrees and yes. all this, and to see steel bent like that, but have vegetation and plant life and eucalyptus well, the trees. Holes, the holes that were burned through the hoods of cars all the way through the engine block are a little bit suspicious. Wasn't that crazy? Yeah. The aluminum on the ground that had melted to the ground where the guy that was I've walking over before. it? 
Okay. That I've seen before. We had a tanker fire, um, a gasoline tanker fire on 101, and those the the gasoline fuel is moved around in aluminum tanks like that, thick aluminum tanks, and that one caught on fire and uh, melted the aluminum like that. Right. So I have seen aluminum melt like that in a structure a structure fire or other fire. Let's talk for a sec about how a firestorm creates, and it's my understanding that a fire has to build its fuel and consume its oxygen to intensify over time as heat builds up over time. But we're getting, we're having this firestorm. These fires happen in a matter of a couple hours and created thousands of degrees temperature without any uh, provocation from fuel to build itself. It just happened. It seems like. Yeah, uh, it seems like. Right. I mean, that's the only, I mean, it just happened over a couple hours and then it was just about, you know, how the fires were spreading. But the initial destruction was here, there and everywhere and everything down to the bone of, of the homes, literally, where all that's left is the fireplace. But there's no iron tubs. There's no granite counters. I mean, we went through uh, old Redwood Highway here and went Mark, Mark Rest Road. And it was just amazing how there was nothing left. I mean, nothing. Yeah, and the fires, you know, they were out there within a few hours. So what could have caused that? A normal, than... a normal temperature up high in a fully involved structure fire is around 1,100 degrees. Mm -hmm. That's normally what we consider operating fire conditions. About 1,100 100 degrees. And the fact is, is that there's a lot of plastics inside households right now so plastics um, liberate a lot more heat than wood would about, right. tw about twice as much did you hear anything about blue lights being seen and yes. anybody saying that i saw the, i saw the photographic uh evidence on the internet did you see i heard of anybody else commenting that they've seen blue lights like they've been commenting on my site that i saw blue flashes i saw it and other people have been saying it as well yeah just some in passing but i saw i saw actual photographs that people took from their cell phones their cameras all right and then and then how do you feel about learning that the planning and zoning commission is having the exact same footprints nearly as these fires were and that now they're declaring some of these areas from a previous fire that could be deemed a fire a severe zone that maybe they shouldn't be rebuilt now have you any comment on that um, well, I guess my comment would be that I'm fully aware of Agenda 21 and that it doesn't surprise me one bit. And have you talked to other firemen as well about this? Are they on the same page as you? Or are they even questioning this? Or what are they thinking? Uh, yes, two others. Two others I've, I've talked with directly about it and are we're all in agreement that something very strange, something very, very unique strange. and new has happened. <laughs> Right, right. And and have you been to tour the areas? Have you looked around at some of the areas? Only what I only what I I've, I've seen on the internet from overhead. Gotcha. And I just drove down 101 so what I could see from the freeway. So what you just conjecture? What do, what do you think these firemen who are looking at these fires they've never seen before and talking among themselves? How do you think they're are they talking about it? What do you think they're cuz they never seen anything like it either and you know, I, you know, listening to that Berkeley engine number six that came up in their whole journey through it, they were totally uh, astounded where they couldn't even set up a, a base station to, to 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 start fighting from because everything was on fire. We have we have a hundred thousand square foot Kmart completely torched by three a.m. in the morning, where these fires leapt across a, a eight lanes of road and torched the Kmart on the other side of the road. What kind of fire does that? Uh, a fully sprinkler building. Well, yeah, that's the other thing is California has one of the highest sprinkler laws in the, in the country. <sighs> Not natural phenomena. Unnatural phenomena. I, like I said, I've never seen anything like it. And the other thing is, is that um, amongst some of the courses that I worked on, I taught a course, um, co-taught co with others. That's where this, this t-shirt comes from. Um, we flew back to uh, Florida twice and worked with these guys one time uh, for a week and uh, taught a course on firefighter safety and survival. And so I uh, have done a lot of case studies on different fires, both wildland and uh, uh, structural fires where uh, uh, firefighters have been killed. And um, I am telling you based on, on my 
studies, of actual case studies that I've never seen anything like we just experienced in Northern California. Hey, it's Tuesday, July 31st, 2018. I'm John Knox in Los Angeles. Now, this picture has been taken off the internet. It's a suburban neighborhood uh, believed to be near the Carr Fire, that's C-A-R-R, -R, which is uh, near Redding, California. Now, we're talking about fires. Irregular, unpredictable, raging forces of nature, okay? Now, when the forest fire comes to a suburban development, we're going to take a look at how this particular forest fire, this force of nature, decided to burn when it got to the suburban development. Now, let's drift the camera a little bit to the left. Now, this forest fire, when it got to this suburban tract, decided that the houses were more important to burn than the trees. And we're going to drift down a little bit here, speaking of trees. now. To the left of this group of trees or bushes, you see the shell of a burned out car. Now, the energy that it takes to blast all of the glass out of the car, to burn all the rubber tires off the car, that's pretty intense energy. So in that spot, there was an amazing amount of energy and heat being expended. And yet, the trees and the bushes off to the right of this particular car did not burn. Okay. That's strange. That's an anomaly, and that's been repeated over and over again in many of the fires. However, if we drift the camera up and to the right, we're going to find something that this irregular, unpredictable, raging force of nature decided to do. The left of this property is decimated. The right of the property, probably about a third of the house, looks like what happens to a decoration on the top of a wedding cake when it's cut. So this irregular, unpredictable, raging force of nature decided to do this to this house. Pretty amazing fires. This is a picture downloaded from the internet of the Santa Rosa fires from October of last year, October 8th and 9th. This is d devastation from the Tubbs fire. Now we've become used to the explanations and the observations of people that show houses being absolutely decimated in place and all the shrubbery completely intact all around it. Getting used to it doesn't mean that you accept it, it means you've heard it a bunch of times. But if we drift the camera up to the left a little bit, you'll see a beautiful sloping field with a precise burn mark on the edge of it. Precise as in exact, precise as in straight. Now remember, fire is a primordial force. It's a force of nature. It's uncontrollable. It's unpredictable. It does not burn in straight lines. If we drift the camera further down, we'll find the pattern which made me understand that this is not a forest fire. This is the Cardinal Newman baseball field. Whatever burned this field stayed within the fences. The tennis courts on the left, the track a little further down, absolutely untouched. But the left field and the entire infield, most of the, in, most of the infield, completely singed all the way over to, to the dugout. A forest fire does not burn leaving straight edges and obeying fence lines.
What's up, friends? Max Mugger with a quick update for Wake Up News about the California fires. Uh, and I'm going to nuke these materials. That's some normal grass, some pine boughs, and some aspen leaves. You can see those leaves are already kind of dried out. It's fall here in Wyoming, where I'm reporting from. And I'm going to go for two minutes. I've already done these for about 30 seconds, but I wanted to start the video over again. Uh, and we're going to see if this stuff burns in the microwave. The reason being... We all know what happens if you put metal in the microwave, right? If you accidentally put like a fork or some aluminum foil in the microwave. Oh, a little noise coming out of there, but so far nothing's bursting into flames. The reason I'm doing this is because out in California with these fires, they call them wildfires, they call them forest fires, but really it seems like a lot more houses and cars are burning than forests. There are these really disturbing images of cars that are completely torched, where the glass is melted out, and the wheels, the metal alloys of the wheels, often they use aluminum for wheels, is completely melted to the extent where there are literally pools of aluminum that ran down the street and have formed these weird little lakes of aluminum. And then right next to these vehicles, you'll see trees and other vegetation that still has foliage on it. I want to showcase for you, as we, we've been in there for a minute and 10 seconds, uh, that vegetation doesn't react in the microwave like, you know, it's not going to burst into flames, it's not going to cause a bunch of sparks like you'd see if you put metal in the microwave. And what are cars made out of? Well, they're made out of various metals. Houses, of course, contain many metal appliances and metal fasteners like nails and screws and stuff. So we see all this footage of cars and houses that are completely obliterated while the vegetation nearby is totally fine. And it prompts the question, are directed energy weapons, microwave weapons, being used to cause these fires in California. We're almost down here cooking up this delicious little feast. Let's see what's going on. Food is ready. Here we go. Generally, I don't use the microwave for anything. So the grass dried out a little. Sorry, my hands are so dirty. I've been working in the yard. So the grass dried out a little. It's a little brittle, but you can see it's not hot. Uh, the pine bough, not hot either. The, lead, the needles seem to have turned a little bit browner. And then the aspen leaves have wilted, but nowhere near ignition. Um, whereas we all know what happens when you put a piece of metal in the microwave. 